<laughs> you need to go protest the Republicans. Well, that didn't happen Tuesday. What does that mean for the country? Good question. Republicans promise to repeal Obamacare, reduce the deficit, reform our tax code. Will they? They fooled me before. We're actually going to help get people out of poverty. You want the truth? You can't handle the truth. Liberals have fooled much of America much of the time, but this time, most lost. It's kind of none of your business. And how did libertarians do? It's time to vote for me. And Coulter threatened to drown us if we did. You're going to cost Republicans the Senate, and that's it. But libertarians didn't cost Republicans the Senate. But why didn't any libertarian win? I'm a libertarian because I know I'm not smart enough to run your life for you. Right. So what does this week's election mean for liberty? That's our show tonight. And now, John Stossel. We now have divided government, and as a libertarian, I say yes to that, because when governments split, when politicians can't agree with each other, they increase spending less, and they're less likely to mess with my life. So what else did the midterm results mean for freedom? Here to debate that is our liberty-loving our liberty -loving panel, columnist Deroy Murdoch, uh, editor of Reason Magazine, Catherine Mangu Ward, and Austin Peterson, who runs the libertarian website, New, the Libertarian Republic website. So, uh, Austin, your website this week featured this show's topic. What, what did you guys conclude? So I did a little research, and I pulled some data from the Cato Institute, which took a look at divided government. And we may actually be going into the most libertarian two years, next two years, that we've seen in a long time, because the type of government with a Democratic president and Republicans controlling the legislature is actually where we get the smallest amount of government growth. That's 0.4% per capita, so per, per person. But versus? You, versus one party, when they control everything, the government grows by about 3.4%, but when you've got divided government, it grows 1.5%. So we're actually preparing to have a major slowdown in government if past trends are like what the next two years will be like. So they keep talking, the Republicans do, we, we want to work with Obama and find areas of agreement, and the public seems to want that. Well, I think uh, what, I'm, what excites me is that uh, there are 347 bills that have been passed by the House that are just gathering dust on Harry Reid's desk right now. And now that uh, Harry Reid's going to be the minority leader, these bills that were passed by the House can be passed again, passed by the Senate, and then put onto Obama's desk. And then he can decide whether he wants to have the uh, reputation he has now, which is terrible and sinking, or if he perhaps can try to save a bit of his legacy and say, all right, I'll go along with getting rid of the medical but device these hundreds desk. of bills don't increase the size of government? Uh, they, they, these generally are bills that are designed to spend less, uh, reduce the, oh. uh, reduce the uh, regulations on the economy, make it easier for, pe for people to start uh, uh, companies and have them prosper. And at least we'll, these things will be on Obama's desk. It'll be up to him whether he gives us a, a chance and a break to move forward or if he c continues to do what he does, which is obstruct human freedom and go even further down in popularity. You know, I'd like to imagine that there is this pile of liberty-loving bills somewhere <laughs> just waiting to be whisked through the political process. Uh, unfortunately, I think that's usually not the case. Republicans uh, have a way of breaking libertarian hearts. We are the red-headed stepchild of the GOP and always will be. Uh, I think the idea that uh, the divided government slows growth is good to hear, but at the same time, uh, the agenda that um, Republicans love to talk about, we're going to shrink government, we're going to make it friendlier for small businesses, blah, 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 they get into power. Somehow it's all forgotten. And we're, we're going to interview one libertarian candidate uh, who lost uh, later on this show, but why do they always lose? Well, they did uh, better this year, but I think it's a consequence of kill. the electoral system. You know, we have lots of rules and regulations for how you can get on the ballot. Libertarians, I used to work for the party, uh, and you actually have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars just to get on the ballot, whereas Republicans, Democrats don't have to jump over these hurdles. So we have, uh, you know, we have this idea we're going to spread democracy overseas, but we don't really enjoy it much here at home. So I think we need to solve the problems of the democracy that we have here and allow more ballot access, and that would solve the problems of people who say they want third parties. Most Americans say they do. If they do, then we need to change these laws. At the same time, though, we have a system that encourages people to try and work within the two existing parties. And I think, you know, we do have sort of a, a brain drain uh, libertarians who have even the slightest bit of hope that the issue they care the most about, whether it's, you know, marijuana legalization or economic liberty, uh, they're going to go to the party where they feel at home. Um, and, and frankly, I, I do think we're seeing some movement of mainstream parties toward a more libertarian platform. 
Just a little. Some. I think that. you also had the pragmatic concern, which is that if you vote for a libertarian in a very close election, you might, might uh, not get the libertarian you want, but you'll get the, the left-wing Democrat who you really don't want. And rather than a little cultury here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a little right. bit. Don't I mean, drown us look, right. um, uh, I've seen some figures that show that um, uh, this man named Sarvis, who ran for Senate in Virginia, got about 28,000 votes. Most of those people, I think, would have voted for Gillespie for Senate. He lost by, well, I guess it's still close. They're still counting, but he's behind, behind by 17,000. If, well, those, if those people had voted for, uh, for him, he probably would, would, have, would have defeated Maybe. The, the exit polls on. showed a lot of liberals voted for him, but we're going to come back to okay. him in the next block. Some libertarians say uh, a GOP majority is worse. Ron Paul tweeted, Republican control of the Senate means an expanded neocon, expanded neocon wars in Syria and Iraq. Boots on the ground are coming. DeRoy, I know you're a libertarian who's okay with that, but most of us are not. Well, I mean, look, we, we've already got uh, all sorts of military action going on in, in Iraq and Syria with Harry Reid and the Democrats running the Senate today. So I don't see how having McConnell and the Republicans in is, would, uh, would give uh, uh, Obama any more opportunity to be there than he already already has today. And I think, you know, Ron Paul's always been much more comfortable in the opposition in a lot of ways. What he's saying is something that's true. Uh, you know, the GOP and Ron Paul do not line up perfectly, even though he, you know, ran and, and uh, served as a Republican. But um, the idea that somehow uh, we're going to wind up with a more warlike uh, presence abroad because of the GOP in power, you know, Frankly, Democrats like war, too, so it's not clear that there'll be a change. Well, Clinton did like, for the Iraq war. I'd like to disagree with Congressman Paul, the, uh, the great Dr. Paul, who I uh, sincerely respect, but I think he's wrong. And the reason why I think he's wrong is because he's not looking at our energy security. And in the next decade, the United States is poised to become the world's leading energy producer. The biggest problem that we have is... So with, then we won't go... F that's why we're overseas? We're grabbing I think, oil? I think that has a lot to do with what the American presence overseas, guarding pipelines, and uh, wanting to uh, maintain private property rights of corporations overseas that maybe they should take those burdens on themselves but maybe they won't have to if President Obama signs the Keystone XL pipeline that would be a good thing but also because of fracking because of natural gas we are poised to become the world's leading energy producer that's exciting I think that's going to result in less wars other news that seems exciting exit polls this year government should do more 41 percent government is doing too much 54 percent which I was happy to see until I went back 20 years and saw it's about the same that people have said before. 20 years ago, they said that, and we got since then Obamacare, Dodd-Frank, stimulus, bailouts, cash for clunkers, and another trillion dollars in spending. So I think a lot of people have looked at what's happened in the Obama years, which is he was going to come in and make us all love the government more and show that government could lead, lead society towards uh, nirvana, I suppose. And uh, I think even people on the left look at the VA scandal, the, the uh, scandal at the IRS, uh, the inability of almost any program to work. And I think a lot of them have thrown up their hands and said, my God, we're doing all this activity, spending all this money, and getting so little positive results and so many negative results. I think a lot of people are very frustrated. Even people who like government think, gee, it really Next is not crisis, turning, I bet turning they out still as well say, as government, come and fix it. <laughs> and unfortunately, what polls actually show is that people universally want government to do more of the things they want government to do and less of the things they want government to not do. And please, could it not? cost any money. This is what every poll shows every time, everywhere. Um, and of course, we all like to read the tea leaves and see that the American public is finally seeing that I am right about everything, uh, but I, I am not convinced that this is the moment. Other good news, uh, ballot initiatives. Legal marijuana now, Alaska, Oregon, and Washington, D.C., and passed by big margins. Yeah, the biggest deal with that is in Washington, D.C., where uh, marijuana is federally illegal, but it's legal in the district, <laughs> which well, probably leave that up. The coolest part of the story that nobody's really talking about is that the Congress has oversight over the District of Columbia, and they have a special oversight committee that is dedicated to taking care of municipal issues in the District of Columbia. Guess who sits on that committee? Senator Rand Paul, who is that? the most marijuana-friendly uh, politician probably in the entire Congress. So that's so not a big pro-legalizer, I don't uh, think. Well, he's said that he doesn't think the federal government should interfere with the District of Columbia legalizing it. So that, that He's the right tallest there. one. What if, we got yeah. the <laughs> what if we got the entire Congress high? What do you think that might do? Uh, I don't think that will happen. I think uh, that the board, then we man. would have a truly do-nothing Congress and it would be delightful. Are they not high already? <laughs> Bad news in the ballot initiatives. Minimum wage increases passed everywhere that they were on the ballot, five states, including Nebraska, South Dakota, you would think this would be a bunch of conservatives who would support economic freedom. 
You know, I think uh, minimum wage increases are something that is the, the best example of the economic illiteracy of the American public. Uh, this is something that almost all economists will say um, there are real costs to this. When you pass an increase in the, in the minimum wage, you, you wind up with uh, lots of people who can't get jobs at that rate. Uh, it's like very simple, basic econ 101. Takes opportunity uh, away from young people and uneducated. And this is, this is something that, uh, you know, this is the danger of the ballot initiative. If you take a bunch of people that don't understand economics and let them make the rules about the economy, this is what you There get. was a campaign ad that showed a black gentleman in Chicago who said, we don't have any jobs. Minimum, minimum wage increase for what? Uh, you're you're going to raise a wage that doesn't exist if somebody's not getting paid? Yeah, and remember, the people who are going to get the minimum wage increase, they're definitely going to go vote. But the people who are looking for jobs, who are going to get priced out of the marketplace, they're not going to vote because they don't see a benefit. And by the way, they don't know that they're being priced out of the marketplace. And if you're right. an employer, you could say, all right, I'll pay the higher minimum wage, but I'm just going to lower your, your, your hours. Mm -hmm. And you end up exactly where you were before. Mm -hmm. uh, final ballot initiatives, the GMO, genetically modified organism labeling provisions, they failed in Oregon and Colorado. Uh, but they were real. The, they were really outspent by the industry. I think again, the ignorant public says, "Oh yeah, this is scary stuff. I want it labeled in my food. What's wrong?" The with The left that? has been very good at calling this stuff Franken foods. I mean, scary, scary stuff. Uh, man has been taking species A and species B and grafting t uh, together into species C, going back to the caveman days. I mean, we've been doing this in agriculture and, and animal husbandry mm -hmm. for. Eons. So this this is nothing new. I think it's being done more precisely now and more safely now. And nobody can point to anyone who's ever gotten sick from a GMO food. If, I, if there is such a person, I'd love to hear who that is. Mm -hmm. But there, why not just label it? They say there's actually been a, a great um, kind of surprising coalition on the GMO labeling issue uh, in Portland. The Alt Weekly uh, in Oregon actually came out against the GMO labeling rule um, and they, they said it was because it was sort of an underhanded way of forcing corporations to behave um, as they didn't want to behave and this, this is I think you know uh, generally you would associate an alt weekly with with a kind of you know crunchy granola let's uh, let's all be scared of GMOs um, but what actually happened is they said listen if we want to ban GMOs let's do that let's not do it by sort of forcing this labeling which is misleading and uh, and will ultimately confuse consumers you know what's hilarious about all this is that the Democrats are always like Republicans they're not the party of science. They believe in creationism, and they're like, "Oh, ban GMOs!" You know, even though we have all this great science behind it. You know, the white and liberal nerves. And if you get people just... to focus on the trivial risks, they don't pay attention to bigger risks. That's right. And yeah. you couldn't yeah. ban it because it's in everything. Every, it's everywhere. Yeah. Thank you all. Uh, to join this discussion, please follow me on Twitter, FBN Stossel. Use the hashtag #Midterms2014, or please like my Facebook page so you can post on my wall. Tell us what you think. Panel, stay with us because I want your take on Ann Coulter's complaint that my voting for libertarians who won't win helps Democrats elect more socialists. We're back with our libertarian panel, Deroy Murdoch, Catherine Mangu Ward, and Austin Peterson. I often vote libertarian and vote for people who don't win. There are people here at Fox who yell at me for that. They say libertarian candidates just steal votes from Republicans who would be better than the socialist Democrats. So what say you? I think there's this insane notion that somehow Republicans and Democrats are entitled to all the votes and that you're taking away these votes that were rightfully theirs. They're not entitled to a single vote. You know, this is when, when people talk about tax cuts as being um, decreased revenue for the federal government. No, it was never their revenue to begin with. You can, you can vote for whoever you want. But Ann Coulter says if the Republicans didn't win, we'll be living in Obamacare concentration camps and it's our <laughs> duty to vote Republican. I think that her argument is the argument against itself. That's funny. I don't think that we have to worry about concentration camps from Obamacare, but as I was saying a little earlier, um, we do have in Virginia this situation where a libertarian by the name of Sarvis, I think, got about 28,000 votes. Uh, Ed Gillespie at the moment... 55,000 Was well, 55, votes. even higher then, okay. Uh, and I believe um, Ed Gillespie is behind uh, Mark Warner by about 17,000. I think most of those libertarians probably would have voted for Gillespie, not for Mark Warner. It may turn out well, that we're going to get... Well, think that, but the exit polls said his votes came 4% from liberals, 2% from conservatives. 
uh, well, there are a lot of people in between who are probably Republicans who may not fall into either of those categories. And that's why uh, Coulter has always been wrong about this, because every time we look at these polls, you see that liberals are the ones who are voting for libertarians. We don't quite know why. We do know that in Sean Haas' case, when he was running, someone spent $225,000 trying to get the Democrats to vote for Sean Haas. They didn't spend that money on the Republican. They wanted to spend it on the liberals. So something's going on here. I think it's actually a bipartisan issue. People are looking at libertarians and saying, we've got the issues that liberals really care about, principled liberals care about, and principled Republicans. Economic freedom and personal liberty. That's what I talk about. You also had uh, the uh, governor's race in Virginia last year, where Ken Cuccinelli was very, very close uh, behind uh, uh, Terry McAuliffe, and a libertarian ran there. I think he won 7 or 8%, maybe 9 And uh, Cuccinelli lost, and so you got Terry McAuliffe, who's not a, any kind of a middle-of-the-road uh, Democrat. He's a far-left Democrat, and obviously the, one of the biggest cogs in the Clinton machine. He's now in Virginia, which is a big, big swing state, and I don't see how having him there as, as governor rather than Cuccinelli does anything for human freedom. Well, Again, though, this gets us back to the idea that somehow Republicans are entitled right. to these libertarian votes, and they're right. not. They're libertarians entitled. are. Libertarians have a platform that pulls from both Dora, sides. They, they have every, every right to run. I'm not saying they should be banned from the ballot, but I, I, I like the advice that uh, Bill Buckley used to give, the late great William F. Buckley Jr., uh, that you should vote for the most conservative candidate who can win. I think libertarians should vote for the most libertarian candidate who can win, or you might end up with somebody who's not only sort of halfway there, you're going to end up with somebody who's 0% where you want that person to be. With, a, with the unfortunate kind of laws that the, that person signs or, or enacts, and you've got to live under them, as let's do your neighbors. Let's talk about voting in general. There's all this <coughs> pressure, you know, you got to vote. You're a hero if you vote. Lena Dunham on the Planned Parenthood website said, you will have the best day just because you voted. It's more effective than ecstasy or cheesecake. Wow. And I, I like amazing. Don Boudreau's response that if fewer people vote, in this election only a third of the eligible voters voted, Good, he said. People might come to depend more on personal initiative and less on untrustworthy, power-craving strangers. <laughs> more on real friendships and less on the fake affectation of politics. The fewer people who vote means things are going well in the country. I think that uh, there's uh, an idea among more Democrats and Republicans that everybody should vote all the time and throw all the ballots out there. I spent some time in Colorado taking a look at their mail-in ballot system. Everybody got a mail-in ballot, not just the people who requested them. What ended up happening is people would go to the post offices, open their P.O. boxes, look at ballots they didn't want to vote, and then throw them in the garbage. I held, I was I actually take a picture of six ballots pulled out of the trash in Pueblo, Colorado. Those could have been filled most out, Most people aren't paying mail. attention to these issues. But it's one thing if you don't show up at the polls. It's another if you've got ballots, stray ballots sitting out there that can be abused. That's a really dangerous situation. I think, though, the idea that somehow voting is praiseworthy or a requirement to be a good citizen, is a, it's a dangerous idea. I, I, I like to think of myself as a good citizen, libertarianism notwithstanding, but I don't vote. And one reason that I don't Ever? vote... Ever. Uh, I ever don't voted? vote. No. Never. Um, and, and I don't vote for uh, two reasons. One, because my vote is not actually going to influence the outcome of an election. Elections are not si decided by a single vote, by and large. Uh, in fact, well, ever sometimes. in recent memory. Occasionally. Uh, Nine elections, small places. But some no of them big coin elections. tosses. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think, you know, more importantly, it's that uh, the incremental value of my vote is so much less than even tweeting something on election day, even sharing that stupidly in a Dunham quote would be a better way to participate in our democracy than to actually bother to drive down to the ballot box. Yeah. I don't know about that. Thank you, panel, though. <laughs> We're out of time for this. We'll come back to you later, though. You can talk more. But next, who's best at predicting election results? Not these guys. Well, you're going to hold the Senate. Democrats could hold on to the Senate. Wrong. So I'll tell you where you can go instead to get better predictions. Before this week's election, did you think that Republicans would do as well as they did? Did you believe the pundits? Why? Remember those confident predictions from last election? Romney will win this election by five to ten points. You'll see a Romney landslide. This year it was Democrats who were wrong. Are you going to lose the Senate? No, we are going to hold the Senate. Democrats could hold on to the Senate. Everyone engages in wishful thinking, which is why we in the professional media like to rely on scientific polls. Except they aren't so great either. In New Hampshire's Democratic primary in 2008, polls showed President, or candidate Obama was up 8%, but then Hillary Clinton won. 
In Maryland this year, most gubernatorial polls had the Democrats up double digits, but the Republican won. Many polls did poorly this year. On average, they underestimated Republican performance by 4%. Fortunately, we don't need to rely on polls anymore because there's something better. Prediction markets. Prediction markets allow you to bet on the results on all kinds of things. Sports. The Packers are big favorites over the Chicago Bears Sunday night. You can bet on American Idol winners, Academy Award winners. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That year, the prediction market bettors picked every nominee correctly. Prediction markets also let you bet on future elections, and there too, the resulting odds are more accurate predictors of future events than polls or pundits, for two reasons, which I'll get to shortly. Before this election, bettors on the British online prediction market, Betfair, said there was an 89% chance Republicans would take the Senate. American pollsters and the statistical geniuses that analyzed them, like uh, Nate Silver of 538, the New York Times, the Daily Coast, Huffington Post, Princeton Election Consortium, and so on, also predicted that Republicans would win. But Betfair was more certain than all of them, all but the Washington Post. In previous elections, the betting site Intrade was more accurate than all the experts again and again. I loved Intrade. I consulted it for all kinds of predictions. Studies showed it had half the margin of error of national polls. In 2004, the odds on Intrade correctly predicted every state's vote in the presidential election. In 2012, Intrade had Obama at above 90%, while the pundits were still saying, oh, it's too close to call. My colleague Eric Bowling didn't like that. I think they should stop looking at the betting sites because the Gallup poll tells it all. 50, I believe it's 51 to 45, if I'm not mistaken. So it gives Romney a 51%. Of course, Intrade was right, Gallup was wrong. Sadly, Intrade no longer exists because arrogant American regulators shut it down. They claim that prediction markets are contrary to the public interest because they were unregulated. Fortunately, prediction markets are still legal in Europe, which is what gave me those Betfair numbers I showed earlier. Betfair refuses to take American customers because they don't want to get in trouble with American regulators. But the betting results still apply to American elections. Now, some good news. Just last week, our control freak regulators did approve one not-for-profit prediction market. It's called predictit.com. The catch is that the American regulators limit how many people can bet and how much. Bets can be no more than $850 each. The regulatory limits are just stupid. They, they make the polls less accurate. They deprive us of accurate information. Because prediction markets work better for two reasons. One is that there's wisdom in crowds. You see this on Millionaire. When contestants are stumped, they can call an expert or poll the audience. Now, the audience is not made up of geniuses, but a study found they beat the experts. The audience got the answer right 91% of the time. Good job, audience. <laughs> the other reason that prediction markets are more accurate is because people bet. They put their own money where their mouths are, and that focuses the mind. So what do the prediction markets say about future elections? Betfair, the biggest, says there's a 40% chance that Hillary Clinton will be America's next president. 40%. That doesn't mean betters believe there's a 60% chance the Republican will win. It just could be another Democrat or maybe Hillary won't run. On the Republican side, betters give Jeb Bush, Mitt Romney, Rand Paul, Marco Rubio, and Chris Christie each a 10 to 16 percent chance to win the presidential nomination. So in two years, we'll see what happens. Next, back to this election. Republicans made lots of promises. Will they keep them? Senator Mike Lee says, yes, we will. Next. So Republicans control both houses of Congress. What difference will it make? 
I keep hearing that Republicans will repeal Obamacare, stop out of control spending, reform the tax code, but I've heard stuff like that before. Republicans said they'd reduce spending once in power, but once they gained power, they spent more. Will this Congress be different? Utah Senator Mike Lee says yes, good things will happen. Senator, tell us what? Well, Winston Churchill once said the American people can always be counted on to do the right thing after they've exhausted every other alternative. In this case, we've exhausted every other alternative, and I think that's one of the many reasons why it will be different this time. So nobody's talking about re repealing all of Obamacare. They say you'll get rid of the medical device tax, um, but that just puts us deeper in debt. Uh, well, I want to point out, first of all, a lot of us are strongly advocating a vote to repeal Obamacare in, in its entirety, even though we know it's likely to be vetoed by this president. It's almost certain to be vetoed. I still think it's important to do. We need to further the national dialogue of, about whether or not this health care law is working. We don't think it is. We think Obamacare is making health care less expensive rather than more. It's uh, interfering with the ability of individual Americans to get access to the doctors that they've come to trust over the years. And it's putting decisions that should be made between a doctor and a patient and putting authority to make those decisions in the hands of government bureaucrats in Washington. But so I think it is important to have a vote on full repo. Yeah, you know, yeah he'll and, veto and Congress it. Can't I, I still think it's that. important for us. And, yeah, and we will not have the votes to override that. But that still needs to happen. This needs to be part of a national dialogue and part of the process of coming up with a replacement for Obamacare, which hopefully we can get passed uh, after the 2016 election cycle and signed into law. Uh, the time will come when we as a party will need to coalesce around a single replacement plan for Obamacare. Right now we don't need one plan, we need ten or more. They need to compete in the marketplace of ideas and uh, eventually will you, we'll coalesce will you get around one. Keystone XL approved? Yes, I think we can get that approved. I, I think there's a way that we can get that done and uh, get it signed into law. The American people have been waiting for this. There are many, many tens of thousands of jobs on the line, and uh, there, there's a lot that this can do for our economy, and it needs to happen. Will you cut uh, corporate welfare like farm subsidies and the Exim Bank? You know, I, I, I think there is no more important place for us to start than with crony capitalism. And you've mentioned some of the programs that I think we need to deauthorize, including the Export-Import Bank. Uh, if we're ever going to reform government, if we're ever going to reform our welfare system, we've got to start by getting rid of corporate welfare, and these are examples of that. And you've uh, fought to create work response, uh, work requirements for welfare recipients. You've made a proposal. Now that will go through. I would like to see it go through. I can't guarantee passage of it and signature of it into law in the next Congress, but it's got to start somewhere, and uh, I, I think that somewhere is right now. Look, we've got a lot of Americans who are trapped in poverty, sometimes for generations at a time, as a result of bad government policy that punishes people on welfare for working. If instead we could turn that around and we could help encourage people to work, it'll help make poverty temporary rather than tolerable. It'll get the government out of the business of holding people in poverty and punishing them for trying to get out. Now, you've supported, I think, some things I consider anti-freedom. You want to ban online gambling, you're for the drug war, you're against gay marriage. Okay, let's start with online gambling. Uh, gambling is a decision that is left up to the states for regulation. In today's modern era, uh, I, I think it's important to preserve within the states the right to decide within each state's boundaries whether or not to allow gambling. But we, we've got a federal statute called the Wire Act that would prevent the Internet from becoming the conduit for breaking down each state's right to make its decision on its own. Uh, the, the Wire Act previously served that purpose, but the Obama administration has interpreted it basically out of existence. Well, I'm getting so lost in the weeds. You think a bill to undo that? If you had the choice, you would ban Internet gambling? And what about gay uh, yes, marriage? I mean, and look, okay, gay marriage is an issue left to the states, uh, at least left to the states until very recently, when in many states, federal courts are being told, uh, federal courts are telling states that they don't have the right to make that decision. Uh, but that isn't a federal decision. There's nothing in federal law, there's nothing in federal constitutional law that 
tells a state that it may or may not, that it must or must not recognize a particular type of marriage. Uh, I would love to continue this more with you if we had more time, but we don't. Thank you, Senator Mike Lee. Coming up, our Libertarian panel will say why he's wrong or right. We just heard from Senator Mike Lee about all the great things Republicans will do now. Do you believe him? Let's ask our liberty-loving panel, columnist Roy Murdoch, Catherine Mangu Ward, editor of Reason Magazine, and Austin Peterson, who runs the Libertarian Republic news site. So, will Republicans do these things, he says? Meet the new boss, same as the old <laughs> boss. You know, Senator Mike Lee has a fundamental misunderstanding of the Constitution if he thinks that he can ban online gambling and still call himself a federalist, someone who believes in states' rights. Because the bill that he was discussing, the Wire Act, which he teamed up with Senator Dianne Feinstein and Lindsey Graham <laughs> on, uh, would have banned online gambling all across the United States. So is this a, a limited government conservative or not? Yeah, I was drowning in his legalisms, but I would think it's a personal freedom issue. If I want to, let me. This what about, he, he's, he didn't really talk about the drug war. He's for that, I'm told, or gay marriage. But. I mean, this is a reminder for libertarians that even when you think, I mean, this guy's pretty good. Libertarians say about like Senator him. Mike Lee, he's a kind of libertarian guy. And yet, when you hear him, you know, when, when you hold his feet to the fire a little on these issues, suddenly he sounds just like a typical Republican. No, I'm against gay marriage. I'm against gambling. I'm against drugs. You know, it's, it's uh, business But as the Republicans have some good ideas. He says regulatory reform, corporate welfare, we'll try to get rid of that, reform Obamacare. It will be different this time, he says. I do think that it's a very good idea, even if we think, or they think that uh, Obama's going to veto these things. It's very important to have a vote on repealing Obamacare, debate it in the House debate it in the Senate. All of us will debate it publicly, write articles, go on tele television, what have you. I imagine that Obama will, uh, uh, will uh, veto it, but that will put everybody on the record. Republicans and Democrats will have to vote on this, and I think it will advance the argument, and the other side will make its arguments, but I think it's good for the public debate for all of us to take another look at this, go through the data, explain how it is making costs more expensive, not lower, and I think it's very good for, to, uh, for the ultimate uh, unveiling, or I should say unraveling of Obamacare to have, have uh, these sorts of test votes, which we now can have because Harry Reid won't be there blocking access to the Senate floor. But I fear they're just going to get rid of the parts that are unpopular, which means they'll have the same thing, but it'll cost more. They're going to get rid of the device tax, and they should. They want to get rid of what they call the death panels, Boehner said today. But if you're spending other people's money, somebody has to rule. We're going to pay for this. We're not going to pay for that. Right, and it's going to wind up being an exercise in partisan point scoring more than some sort of consistent ideology. I mean, I think DeRoy is right that it's good to get everyone on the record, but frankly, everyone already is on the record on you know, where they stand on Obamacare. If we do go through this entire process, it's, you know, weeks and weeks on the floor. It's, you know, everyone making speeches for, you know, directly into the record that no one will watch in real time. I think it is primarily political theater with perhaps a little bit of fiscal downside when all is I do think done. what you will see, though, is uh, if you had one giant bill, which is the Obamacare Repeal Act of 2015 with all the GOP ide ideas on it, Democrats would vote against the whole thing top to bottom. But if you say, all right, well, what about the device tax? What about being able to, to uh, purchase insurance across state lines? What about medical malpractice? practice reform. You're going to find Democrats voting for some of them for all for these medical things. malpractice reform. They get most of their money from lawyers. Yeah, but some of them will vote for it. And, and I mean, you can have a, any number of different uh, aspects of this you can vote on. And I think you will see that Republicans uh, have opposed this and you'll find Democrats uh, on a bipartisan basis opposing a whole lot of Obamacare. And that again will chip away at this and erode, erode mm -hmm. support for it while we see prices going up and so on. Well, I just want to say that Obamacare, <laughs> my premiums went from $97 a month to $240 a month. There and I know. lost my health insurance yep. because of that, about uh, that for a short term but let's not forget civil liberties here he held he held senator mike lee to the fire on gay marriage let's yep. remember our friends in the homosexual community we, we, uh, my senator mike lee he's a constitutional scholar maybe he should read the 14th amendment right. where we have the privileges and immunities you know if you and i can get married uh catherine if you and i can get married why is it that our homosexual friends can't do that if the 14th amendment says we're all equal then why do, why can't we enjoy even more that? i hate to tell you I, we can't get married well because you're married but <laughs> even, even more fundamentally than that i'd like to see mike lee or other people say look why is the government involved in marriage 
at all. Agreed. Why do you need a, mar why do you need a license? If you want to get married, go And get I will married. say, Republicans... Why is it the government's bloody business to begin with? Republicans, Republicans recently have actually said that sentence on the record recently, and that is a new development. Rand, Rand Paul has said, you know, all things being equal. Oh, Justin Amash, another yeah. uh, libertarian the friendly separation, guy. Separation of marriage and state. They uh, want our so, tax revenue, though. They want to track us. They want to know how and, much and, we're making. But the fact that a politician would even say that out loud is progress. Yeah. And other progress, I'm just hearing more people say, gee, maybe we're doing too much. Spending really is a problem. Am I deluded? Have they always said that and not meant it? Or is this new? I think the government is so busy doing so many things, it's not able to focus on the important stuff that, that uh, even some conservatives and libertarians agree. Taking care of poor people who can't take care of themselves. The federal government right now is busy writing uh, federal standards for ceiling fans. My God, they can't leave ceiling fans alone? As so, well as a million other a things. A million other things. Thank you, DeRoy, Catherine, Austin, coming up. The man Ann Coulter said she wants to kill. You know what burns me? That the state thinks it can come into my bedroom and judge my marriage. Get out of my bedroom, you perverts. Yeah, you pervert politicians, get out of most of our lives. That was a campaign ad from North Carolina Libertarian Senate candidate Sean Hall. He lost Tuesday, but he did get 4% of the vote almost. Ann Coulter said she would kill Hall if he cost Republicans the Senate. He didn't, and North Carolina Tom Tillis defeated Kay Hagan. Sean Hall joins us now, so uh, would you feel bad if you had spoiled it for the Republicans? Well, I'm feeling great, uh, and it really, no, it wouldn't bother me one bit at all, because the whole spoiler theory, to me, is complete nonsense. It's based on this notion that all that matters is what goes on underneath that little dome in Washington, D.C., while I'm trying to talk to people I'm, you know, in the checkout line with at Costco and trying to talk to people in the real world, and I think people responded to me because you know, I'm a regular working person and not part of that whole political class. You don't class. think the Republicans would be less disastrous than the Democrats? Uh, well, they've had the opportunity before and they didn't do too much with it. So I really represent a lot of people, including a lot of libertarians who've given up on both parties and don't count on them for anything. And I, the, a lot of the feedback that I got was from people who said that I gave them a reason to show up to begin with, that they wouldn't have voted for either Kay Hagan or Tom Tillis at all, and were happy to have an alternative in me. And and I think the exit polls show the libertarian candidates took from both parties and also brought in a bunch of people who wouldn't have voted for anybody. Well, yeah, because I campaigned on uh, issues to stop all war and stop spending more money than we have and tried to talk about common sense perspectives that people would look at stop, and say, why isn't... Stop all war. Stop all war. Would you have not attacked Afghanistan after 9-11? No, I don't think anybody in the world would have minded if we had gone after the actual perpetrators of that, but instead we used that as an excuse to enter into this perpetual war throughout the entire region now, which is not working, and now we have this new bombing campaign in Iraq and Syria, and people look at that and say, why should that work when it's never worked before? So you ran these ads, a very low budget campaign, mm -hmm. shot them in your campaign manager's basement. Yeah. You're holding a, a craft beer. Why? Yeah, well, I wanted to present myself as just a regular guy that you could sit down and have a beer with. And I wanted to do something that would get people's attention. So you don't see candidates drinking beer too often in their own ads. Uh, and then the first uh, camp or the first ad that I did uh, people noticed that I was drinking exactly what kind of beer I was drinking so I thought well this is an opportunity for me to promote North Carolina craft beers <laughs> and and so I use North Carolina craft and, beers and for by, all the rest of my by videos profession by trade you are really a pizza delivery man I'm going back to work on Friday and I can't wait frankly I'm really looking forward to getting back it's the exact opposite of politics it's simple honest work you know, I'm providing a very tangible service to people, and then at the end of the day, I'm done. I don't have to worry about what was left undone the next day, and I don't have to, you know, look past anybody, any of my allies' sins, you know, to, in order just to deliver a pizza. Well, you don't hear that often from, from politicians. Let's talk about your, your exit polls. 4% of liberals voted for you. 2% of conservatives, right. so more liberals than conservatives, and more young people. 9% of the 18 to 24 vote, only 2% mm -hmm. of the 50 and over crowd. Yeah. 
and even fewer one percent of the over two hundred thousand dollar earner route so the libertarians aren't just plutocrats well no it's uh in fact i think it's just the opposite it's that we're appealing to people who live in the real world rather than in this sort of made-up political world that we see on TV all the time. Uh, and you know, they saw that I was offering solutions that would help them in their daily lives, to let them keep all the money that they earn, uh, and, and as well as to stop all war. I think part of it, too, is that the way that I ran my campaign if you put it in that left-right paradigm, a lot of my issues sound like they're out on the left. So, the, And there are Democrats who are just as discontented with their party as there are among Republicans who are looking for an alternative. But you believe in economic so, freedom, right? Well, absolutely. But I think everybody wants economic freedom. Except you, a, a disproportionate number of people who voted for you want to raise the minimum wage. Well, I think that that's because it was a, a less important issue to them than the issues that I was talking about or presenting of just fiscal sanity, having government take less less of our wealth uh, and and to stop all war of every kind but I think that uh, the that what happened with I'm sorry I lost my train of thought there. well on that note <laughs> well he's lost it thank you Sean <laughs> Hawk. Uh, he posted a bunch of videos on YouTube my favorite was this one I'm a libertarian because I know I'm not smart enough to run your life for you yes if only more politicians understood that you are not smart enough to run my life in his book, The Fatal Conceit, Frederick Hayek wrote that the curious task of economics is to teach man how little he knows about what he imagines he can design. Republicans and Democrats now spend more than three trillion of your dollars trying to design your life, but most of what they do hurts our lives. Maybe this new group of Republicans will be different. They do say things that sound good, one example, they say they'll reform the tax code so American companies don't flee the country. All these great companies have money overseas. They could bring it home and stimulate our economy. We could have a boom like we haven't seen in years. We could. Prosperity is what happens when government keeps the peace, but otherwise leaves people alone. Maybe this Congress will do some of that. That's our show. See you next week.